Welcome to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak with yoga therapist, editorial director, and author, Lori Highland Robertson. After more than a decade in scientific, healthcare, and business publishing, Lori found her way to the transformational practices of yoga and then yoga therapy. She is now the editorial director for the International Association of Yoga Therapists, where she serves as editor in chief of Yoga Therapy Today magazine and managing editor of the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. She co edited Yoga Therapy Foundations tools, and practice, a comprehensive textbook for graduate level yoga trainings, and co-authored the popular book, Understanding Yoga Therapy, Applied Philosophy and Science for Health and Well-Being. Combined with her 20 plus year publishing career, Lori's additional experience as co-owner of Whole chiropractic gives her unique perspectives on healthcare systems and clinical care. She maintains a private practice as a yoga therapist in the Baltimore, Washington area where she owns Whole Yoga and Pilates. Welcome to Adjusted Reality. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Being able to engage with our audience a lot about what they can do for them, the self-care aspects, improving their life and maximizing their mobility. And I think there is no better person to bring on this show than you. And so we're going to kick it right off with some questions that have come up over the 37 episodes we have done with Adjusted Reality, which is really a very happy place to be. One question is the listeners want to know, is there a difference between yoga and yoga therapy? Are they the same thing? And can you tell us a little bit more about both? Sure. So yoga is yoga therapy is a subset of the larger practice of yoga. Uh, So all yoga therapists start out as yoga teachers. And then just like me, most of us decided that we wanted to learn more. We recognized that the people we were teaching in our general classes were having benefits of the practices. We were probably experiencing these benefits ourselves. And we had a craving to learn more and to learn how to apply all of the tools and practices of yoga to help support health and well-being in really specific ways. And it, it's that all of the practices of yoga, I think that that's particularly important. In, in Here in the West, we have this idea of yoga as a physical practice. We think of, you know, what when your listeners see the word yoga, an image probably pops into their mind. It's probably uh, a thin, <laughs> probably white, probably female person in a complicated pose. Maybe they've, they're have they doing a handstand or they've got their foot behind their head or something like that. We tend to think of yoga as a physical practice, but the physical practices are just one small portion of the whole system of yoga. Yoga is a technology. It's a roadmap for how you can live your life. Uh, and, and I think that that gets to a number of of other subjects that we'll probably touch on during our discussion. Um, That was very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, Bringing, bringing in the practice of yoga and yoga therapy um, as, as it helps um, someone, especially many times with ailments that um, perhaps we're sitting too long at our desk and we start to to notice, you know, I'm not as flexible as I used to be. And I look at the stats in elderlies that fall and most of it is balance related. And these statistics of our aging adults 
that are having balance issues come because what most people don't recognize in our general population that is aging. And, you know, I was shocked when the Census Bureau came out with, we're going to have more aging adults than we will have babies in the next five years. So our aging adult population is growing tremendously. We want them to be healthy and well-balanced. And it comes with an understanding that your balance starts to decrease naturally. That's just a degenerative process that that happens. Like hair goes white and, you know, muscles start to um, to unfortunately decline in their um, strength and ability. And so does our balance. So I think with that, I believe the yoga population is really starting to take off. And there, um, there is a... Uh, understanding now as I I shared you shared with me some of the 2016 highlights from a study that was done in America about yoga and I was shocked to see 36.7 million U.S. yoga practitioners at, at that time that's a lot and um up from 20 million in 2020 12 in 2012 so the practice of yoga and the number of yoga practitioners is really growing and, and more significantly more involved in other forms of exercise as well, such as running, cycling, weightlifting, and, and whatnot. But 74% of American practitioners have been doing yoga for five or fewer years. So we're really starting to see the balance of how yoga is touching lives in, in even just going back to 2016, the growth that's been happening and you watching it. But tell me from your perspective, since you have such an eclectic view of yoga, being an instructor, being an author, and then being an editorial, why do you think yoga is really gaining such great momentum? Well, you hit on a, a number of key points there. And, and that study that I shared with you, and, and maybe we can link to it um, with this episode. And unfortunately, it is a, it is several years old now, but it, it that is the largest study that I know of and, and the most recent. People come to yoga with this idea that it will help them. So usually they arrive with an idea of getting help with back pain is, is the number one single specific reason that people might start a yoga practice uh, or just general stress relief. So people come with this idea that, that the practice of yoga uh, might be able to help them in some way. And I, I think it's, it's important to talk a little bit about what yoga is. You know, we sort of, we, we talked about what yoga therapy is briefly, but to back up a step, what, what is this practice of yoga? Because we already said it's not just these fancy physical postures, and which is good news for, for all of us. I can't put my foot behind my head. I don't know about you. No, I can't either. <laughs> it's not, not an option on the table. Uh, and that's okay. Um, I had a, a teacher who, when asked to explain what yoga is, she would say she would she would bring up a quote that's often attributed to Viktor Frankl, and Frankl said, or someone <laughs> said, there between stimulus and response there is a space, and in that space lies your power to choose, and in your power to choose is your freedom. So between the stimulus and the response there is a space. And what yoga does is it widens that space. It gives you more space, more time, more freedom to choose between a stimulus, between some input into your body, your mind, your life, and your response. So we can start to shift over time reaction to chosen response. And I think that that for me really encapsulates what yoga is and and what it can do in your life the the very first time i did yoga it was in i think 2000 and at the time i belonged to a gym and it was a traditional sort of a gym with free weights and um there was a boxing ring an actual boxing ring with a buzzer and lights and they said, we're going to start this yoga thing. 
uh, and somehow I heard about the first class and my husband and I went and I think there was one other person and they had the class between the boxing ring and the free weights. There was a little space of carpet between these these two activities that were going on and this this teacher stood in front of us on the carpet, no mats, nothing like that, and led us through a series of postures. And meanwhile, there are people punching each other on one side and people dropping very heavy weights on the other side. And just simple postures, lunges and downward dogs and things like that. And periodically, the teacher would would tell us to pay attention to how we were breathing and how we were feeling. And I went home from that experience and I said to my husband, that was different. I feel different. It feels good to go and run on the elliptical. I feel good after I do that kind of work, but this is something else. And he said, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that was. Let's do it again. And so we kept going back. And even with all this activity happening around us, as we're taking this class, it still started to have this effect that we could tell was something different than regular exercise. And the reason for that is that it it is a whole body system, a whole mind, body, spirit system. We're not just physical beings. And, and yoga attends to all the layers of our being. And so we started to feel those effects right away. And I think many practitioners of yoga have a similar experience or, or can talk about something similar as they really get into the practices. So it might be the physical practice that draws you in. You might come to the practice to get some stress relief, to get some relief from your back pain. But over time, the reasons that you stay tend to shift. And, and one of the really cool things that that study that you cited, they found not only are people who practice yoga more likely to engage in other kinds of, of physical activity, which you mentioned, they're also very likely to say that they pay attention to sustainable eating and that they volunteer in their communities. So you can see that that it, maybe it starts with that physical practice, but then it ripples out and it affects all the, the levels of your being. That is an excellent way to describe that. Now, we had a guest who was an endurance athlete, and I do share the same experiences. There is a meditative portion to running that he found just being in nature that he forgets that he's running. Now I have a girlfriend who would laugh and say, there's no way I would forget I was ever running. But I remember one morning specifically, I started at 5 a.m. I was running the track and my watch went off that it was six o'clock. I'd done my six miles and it was vibrating. And I literally felt like I woke up. And when I first engaged in yoga, it was that exact same experience. It's like, there was no way that an hour just went by. And for the listeners, I want you to also hear Lori's story because everybody's experience is very different. I think when they come to yoga for the first time and the practitioner or the instructor has a very different canvas to work with because you're you and you're an individual. And sometimes I hear stories much like I didn't like that dentist or that lawyer didn't work for me. It's going to be the very same experience when you come to a practice where you're looking for something specific. Like sometimes you're really looking for the physical. And I love that you shared with us that it you noted the difference right away. It wasn't you know, being in the boxing ring, which, which to me, could you have gotten a more sincere reality check right there? <laughs> There's massive, um, uh, physical being in a, in a, in a boxing ring. And then you've got the adrenaline of someone pumping rates and dropping them because they can't handle the, the weight to which they just lifted. It's such an extraordinary experience. And it brought you into your own zone if you will, of understanding and exploring the physical piece of this. And one aspect is the principles of yoga and that it is much more than just an athletic event. 
it comes down to mindfulness in the spiritual portion of it. And um, can you just touch a little bit more on when people start to go into the, the outside of the physical aspect of yoga, maybe a little bit more about the meditative and the philosophy, because there's some beautiful things just with breath and learning the words like pranayama and, and those kind of things that, that really have, I think so much deeper meaning when you come out of yoga, the practice and start learning the philosophy. Yeah, that's, it, it's sort of the, the philosophy and the other practices that often keep people going, but they can also be your entry portal. And you said something really important about how individualized the practice of yoga can be. And just as there are lots and lots of different flavors of yoga practice and lots of different ways to teach it, there are different ways you could come into the practice. So meditation is a big component of yoga, but your meditation doesn't have to look like sitting very still, not moving a muscle, very erect spine, that doesn't have to be your meditation. The, your guest who is an endurance runner is meditating, I would argue, during probably some significant portions of his runs. You experience that too. So your meditation might be movement. There might be a, a very physical component to your meditation. And likewise, your exercise, so physical movement is part of yoga, your exercise might look very different than mine. And it might look very different from day to day. So I think that that I would encourage listeners to find a yoga home, let's say, that resonates with them, a place that supports their needs, and a place that offers the whole practice of yoga. There's nothing wrong with just the physical practices of yoga, but we can amplify the physical effects by attending to the other dimensions of yoga practice. And underpinning all of it is this yoga philosophy that you mentioned. And, and that's when we talk about the practice of yoga being thousands of years old, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the philosophical underpinnings. And the, that tradition is, is a couple of thousand years old. And so we can honor that and bring that wisdom forward when we look for practices and yoga spaces that, that incorporate all of those elements, the physical, the mental, emotional the energetic, right, which we might we might talk about the breath work, the pranayama that you mentioned, the awareness piece, the mindfulness piece, all of those things underlined by the philosophical principles, ethics of, of yoga. So I think that, um, you know, we're multidimensional beings. And yoga has tools has layers that address all of those dimensions of our being. And that's one of the reasons people find it so effective. And I think that that's one of the reasons ultimately it's attractive for people. You know, we talked a little bit about why is yoga becoming more and more popular. And we think that that is still on an upward trajectory, but you know, from those 2016 numbers, we think that it's, it's still increasing. There's certainly still room for it to increase. Uh, and I think it's because it is, self-care it's something it's self-directed something that you can do for yourself maybe you have the support of a yoga therapist but you're the one doing the practices and there's that's something really attractive uh, especially today as we may feel that we're we don't have the agency we might like in in every area of our lives you know we had involuntary lockdowns from covid and and we don't always get to to operate in the world in the way that we would like to and yoga is a self-directed practice, and it can be a practice of healthcare. So that's that's incredibly empowering and exciting, I think. It is, and bringing it back to 
the healthcare practice of it. And I, I like that our listeners are starting to see yoga in a more broader perspective and we'll home in on the physical aspect, but for a moment, just really appreciating the words that you um, spoke about finding your yoga home, finding a place where you fit. But I also want to encourage, it may not be the first place you go. You may have to find a few different, like there's a, there's a philosophy that I like to, to often put out there, which is, um, uh, eat a little taste a lot is you're, you're tasting a lot of different things. You may think to yourself, I, I don't think I could ever sit for an hour just peacefully and meditate. There's no way. Hold on a second. We want to try it. Just taste what that feels like and see if it resonates. Because if you never try it, you're ha- you have no idea if you're if you're going to like it. And raising two young teenage boys, it's it's often the thing that that inspires me the most is I just want you to try this. If you don't like it, totally good with it. But I want you to have the experience of it. And I think having different experiences like this in yoga really does shape who you are and you said it well, it's an individual practice. And our recent history in the world is we've had a lot that has been taken from us and a lot of fear that has been brought into our lives. And I think when you start to have a philosophy and understand the philosophy of the inner coming to the external, which is your body, you start to appreciate. And what I do love about yoga is the respect the respect of the people around you and the enlightenment of the instructor to bring peace into your life. And it, the peace is both in the physical and in the mental and, and peace is where I think we all need to strive in our lives. If it's hectic and crazy and you never get a chance to, to really get up and stretch for your desk because you're just powered in, you take those beautiful moments to engage in yoga and in any form of yoga, physical, mental, or spiritual, and you start to get the understanding that there's a greater meaning for you in your individual career, in your individual life, and the adventures that you take on, but bringing it back to the healthcare. Can you share with us a little bit about how yoga helps with the physical, the balance that we spoke, the flexibility. Okay. We may not be touching our ears um, with our foot, which would be a lovely thing to do, but I can't do it. And, and Lori, I'm glad that you admitted you couldn't either. Um, watching my sister do it. It's always impressive, but also about mobility, just being able to carry out our activities of daily living. Yeah, that's, this is a great, a great thing to talk about because I think um, there's often this idea of yoga as being synonymous with stretching, uh, that is sort of Eastern inflected or fancy, fancy stretching. Um, and that flexibility is, is always a good thing. Uh, so I, maybe we can un- unpack that a little bit, but just to, to give a, give a little bit of a definition. When I talk about flexibility, I'm talking generally about the, the, ability to temporarily lengthen a muscle. And when I talk about mobility, I'm usually talking about how well a joint moves. So flexibility and, and mobility are related, but but not the same thing. And the, you know, we often think that flexibility translates to decreased risk of injury. You know, the um, American Council of Exercise is, is one organization that has produced research that, that says that increased flexibility is going to be protective against injury. Um, most research, though, shows that joint mobility plays the major role. So it's not, it's not just that, that flexibility, um, but it's also that mobility, which includes stability of the joints, it includes coordination, it includes strength and flexibility. So we can think of yoga practice as affecting all of those things. But if you're coming to me as a yoga therapist, I'm not necessarily interested in whether you can touch your toes or put your foot behind your head. What I'm interested in is your range of motion. 
how good do you feel in your body? And like you said, how well am I, how well are you able to carry out your activities of daily living? So how do you feel in your body? Back to that, that individualized piece of it. Um, so, you know, we can do physical postures that provide a gentle challenge to both flexibility and mobility. And we get to do that in, in the controlled environment or the relatively controlled environment of, of the yoga class or the yoga session. Um, we can gently push the boundaries of that flexibility and keep ourselves mobile as we age. You mentioned earlier how balance declines as you get older, it's a natural function of aging and we can take some steps to be proactive and protect against that. So a physical practice of yoga does typically include a, well, a well-rounded practice, does typically include some balance challenges. Um, and it's not just standing on one foot, you could do these sitting in a chair, you can challenge your balance in that way. And just like we were talking earlier, how it's not just physical, but it's also mental and emotional. Think about this idea of balance more broadly. The balance is also mental and emotional, and it's related to the state of our mind. So if we are scattered and can't focus, our physical balance is going to be affected. So yoga is something that, that can help us with that kind of balance. It can help with physical balance. It helps you to learn where your body is in space, which maybe sounds like a funny thing. Um, so this sense of proprioception, sense of where you are in space. And that I said earlier that most people come to yoga in the West for physical reasons, but paradoxically, we in the West tend to walk around forgetting that we even have a body. You know, we're in our heads most of the time. And so in the process of addressing your flexibility, your mobility, your balance, you're coming back into your body. You're reuniting body, mind, spirit, right? Yoga means union or to unite. And that's one of the senses that we mean when we say that, one of the senses that we're talking about that in. So it's sort of a long, a long answer, but I, you know, and I also would take it a step further because not, not only do these practices affect balance, flexibility, mobility, but they also change the way hormones are expressed in our systems. They can reduce inflammation. We have some good research showing that now. And so therefore they can affect your overall health and well-being even if you're not doing any of the movement practices, or even if you're doing the movement practices in a chair or a bed. So I, I, it's back to this whole system effect. I very much enjoy thinking about it as a whole system effect, especially when we start talking about walking around. Yes, we all have bodies, but are we really recognizing those bodies? Because when you think about it, you're right. You contemplate most of your day is very mental. And the few of us that enjoy the physical aspect of our jobs um, in today's world, they often have the luxury of being able to meditate when they do it because they get so involved in what they're doing physically that the body just relaxes. And I found that over the weekend, just, just really doing a deep cleaning is it's so peaceful because you're not worrying. And, and for me, anxiety and worry, I bring to the yoga table and I bring it so that I can release it and I can balance that objective. And then it goes back to being more thoughtful to the body itself. And sometimes we forget, you know, you have an irritation somewhere and you just kind of push it off and you don't take care of it. And it becomes 
one of those places where you can't ignore it anymore and now you're just frustrated. So now you have to do something about it. And I know there's lots of listeners out there. They have these little aches and pains. They're not doing anything about it. And they expect that by doing the same thing over and over again, they're going to have a different response and it doesn't work that way. So healthcare professionals working together is really a, a key to I see the future. And what I love that you said about unite, there, there's something magical about the word unite because it it's a it's a wholesome word. Unite to me brings a peacefulness to the practice of yoga, but also uniting in philosophy of helping the body heal. And I wanted to ask you about like working in the jobs that you have previously done in the career that you have chosen, how do you see the healthcare providers and yoga working together? That's a great question. And I would say, just as we've talked about there not being one type of yoga or one dentist or one whatever that's right for all people, I think there's not going to be one type of healthcare that addresses all of your needs or that is quote unquote right for everyone. I think one of the ways that yoga can be a really strong partner with lots of different kinds of, of healthcare. And then I probably will talk a little bit about chiropractic uh, because that is one of, one of the hats that I, I wear, not as a chiropractor, but as the, the co-owner of a chiropractic clinic um, and a former chiropractic assistant. Uh, but but to, to back up a step to be a little bit broader, we were talking about living in your head. And if you're living in your head, it's really difficult to not only to, to remember that you have a body, but how would you possibly know what might be nourishing for that body? How do you get the signals that, oh, it's time to get up from my desk and stretch and maybe move in the opposite way or go get a snack? If I'm not in touch with what's going on in my body, that's going to make it a lot more difficult for me to be a good consumer of, of healthcare services. So I think that, that that is a broad way that yoga helps. Um, chiropractic specifically, you know, there are a couple of obvious ways that, that yoga can be a good partner for chiropractic care. And then a couple of, of less obvious ways. And some of the, the more obvious ways are by keeping you mobile. Um, it can be self-care after you've gone through a course of care it can help you to maintain the work that you've done with your chiropractor um, it can be maintenance care right just to to keep you keep you going um, there is that flexibility piece too so tight muscles over time are going to pull on your joints and over time potentially pull them out of alignment, cause pain, cause decreased mobility. Um, so we can we can make the chiropractor's job easier by practicing yoga and keeping our, our range of motion strong. And I think the two practices really support each other well physically in that way. There's also this idea of the multidimensional nature of yoga. So maybe you've had a, a recent surgery. And in that case, you're going to be looking more to the breathwork practices or the meditative practices of yoga uh, to, to support your healing. Maybe you're, you live in a body that is less mobile, for whatever reason. Um, so we can start with whatever portal of entry suits us in the given moment on a given day at any given time and go into the practices from there. And that's a way that we can complement lots of different kinds of healthcare. So maybe you're working energetically with your acupuncturist and you want to 
work more on the physical with your yoga therapist. And those two professionals can be in communication and they can work together to really support your overall well-being. So back to that again. And I think that that we're really going to start to see in the future people choosing this kind of integrative care, this truly integrative care that that brings together different kinds of professionals, different areas of expertise to address the whole person. It's so incredibly important to create a world where opportunities exist for the individual and patient centric, if you will, is being putting the patient right in the center of their care so they can facilitate what their needs are. And it's an interesting thing because we were we were talking in a corporate setting about in corporate wellness, how do they decide which avenue they go? And one of the fellows that was at the table really noted that when you place a patient in the center and you give them objectively all the information they need, they will always make the best choice. Because fundamentally, when you agree to a service that feels right for you, you're more likely to adapt, improve, but most importantly, stay with that endeavor. Mm. Forcing a square peg into a round hole never fits well. And fear often plays a factor. So when you educate them well, they make better choices. And does that not go for everything in life? Is you, If you get all of the objective information up front and you decide it, it's either A, worth the risk or B, it's not worth the risk and you decide going forward. And that's that's really where um, healthcare needs to be is the patient making the final decision, knowing what the risks are or knowing what the benefits are to make their journey into a better place. And I know the American College of Physicians recommended yoga as a treatment for people with chronic low back pain. Now, chronicity is a big piece of today's world because we have a host of unfortunate adverse events with medications such as opiates and addiction and trying to get people to see first a non-pharmacological option. And you said very eloquently that, you know, chiropractic and yoga can have some um, multiplicity layered impacts from the mental, the physical, and um, the spiritual well-being. Can you elaborate a little bit on, let's just take, since back pain is the number one disability across the world, according to the World Health Organization, can you elaborate on the yoga and chiropractic as, as we just talked about, specifically in the back pain world and the experience that you've had owning the clinic and also being in this world so heavily as an edit as an editor. Sure. So we know that back pain is not just one thing, right? It's, uh, it's, there's an emotional component to it. There is a physical component to it when we get into chronicity, so as you mentioned, this is a huge problem, causes so much disability and so much suffering worldwide. When we get to the chronic phase, so you've had this pain for more than a couple of months, say, there may not be a physical component to it. Not so much, right? That might be the initial injury or whatever happened to you might be resolved, but the pain is continuing. And so we need tools that address that multifaceted nature of the problem. And that's that's one reason yoga is a great fit um, for a problem like chronic low back pain in particular. It's self-directed. Yoga is self-directed. So back to, to this idea of being empowered to take care of yourself. I'm reminded of a quote from Dr. Timothy McCall. He's a, he's a medical doctor and he's a yoga therapist. And he says, yoga is strong medicine, but it is slow medicine. Mm -hmm. So you might, you might have that instantaneous effect, right? Like I noticed something right away when I took that class next to the boxing ring, I felt an immediate effect. And I think there's there's an analogy to chiropractic here too. You'll, after that first final adjustment, you might be like, wow, 
I felt something there that felt really good. But it's the, the real work happens over time. And unlike, say, an opioid or an, uh, another drug that you might take, which will get less effective over time, and you'll need to take more of it over time to have the same effect, unlike that, yoga practice gets more effective the more you do it. As you're widening that space between the stimulus and the response, you get more and more space in, in your life. So when we're talking about yoga specifically for, for back pain, I think another piece of that that I just want to mention is that there's not only good news that we have good quality evidence that shows that it can help, but also that it's safe when it's appropriately individualized and, and you're appropriately supported it's a very safe thing to do so again unlike some of some of the other options for working with chronic pain it's a pretty safe thing to do so we can look at it through the physical window we can think about stretching muscles that need to be stretched we can think about strengthening muscles that need to be strengthened we can think about stabilizing areas in the body that need to be stabilized. And all of these things will generally support the health of your back, make the chiropractor's job easier, make their work more effective. We can think about affecting your mental and emotional processes. So this is one of the reasons that, that yoga is effective as a means of health care is that it works from what we call top down. So neurocognitive works from top down and it also works from the bottom up. So neurophysiological. So when we talk about top down practices, usually we're talking about something like meditation, which in turn can have an effect on your physical being and an effect on the way you act in the world. So maybe there are some behaviors that you're doing, and there probably are, we talked about the multifaceted nature of back pain. So there are some things that you can do as a patient to change your experience of back pain. Maybe it's remembering to get up and stretch at your desk. Maybe it's the kinds of foods that you're nourishing your body with or not nourishing your body with other substances that you're using. So we can change the way we are in the world we can change the way we are in our body by working with mental practices and likewise we can change our mental processing and our behavior by working with the physical body so we can do those practices that we know are likely to be beneficial for somebody who has back pain and by doing them mindfully by doing them within this whole context of yoga as a system this, uh, with the underpinning of the philosophy. And you said respect earlier, which is a huge portion of it, respect for yourself, respect for your body is part of it. So when we do those physical practices with those intentions, then we can have an upward cascading effect as well. And I'm gesturing here to my head and, and my body and going up and down. And we know that that's not entirely accurate you know our mind is throughout our body we, it's not just the organ of the brain so it's a little bit of a of a, an oversimplification but i think i think folks get the idea of what we're talking about here that was very comprehensive in terms of trying to really discern when a patient feels there, there's a sense of hopelessness, oftentimes when you get into a chronicity of an injury. And if there's one thing I want our listeners to really bring forth is hope is there. It's the first one to enter. It will always be the last one to leave when you come into the practice of yoga or you're getting a chiropractic adjustment. It's being able to know that the body does have restorative properties and respecting and also having that moment of intuition that sometimes you need to just stop, be present, and adopt what intuitively you sense. It may be a moment where you reflect on your day 
and you set your intentions for your practice and you say, I'm quick to anger. And that flares up my back pain. And, and if you think about it, how can it not? Because back pain is made of muscles and joints. So if you're angry, what happens to us when we're angry? We tend to get tight. We tend to reduce the blood flow and we tend to be less flexible, right? So creating that intention and bringing it in with the sense of hope and rehabilitation and bringing it to you, the individualized user is quite a beautiful thing. And it reminds me of this very specific story I'll share with you before I ask you the next question, because this, this is very, very helpful for us moving through balance, stability, flexibility, mobility, and strength. But the story is um, a few years back, there was a, a owner of a, um, gym. Everybody was extremely competitive and the owner came as, as such to, um, to chiropractic and getting adjusted and very competitive individual. And he hired a yoga therapist to, um, to teach in his facility. He himself did not go to the yoga therapist until one day when he was approached and tapped and said, we really like you to engage in this class so you know what, what your customers are experiencing. He says, no, 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 I don't need yoga. And the question then came to, is it a need? And he sat there for a moment and I, I reflected because I remember this moment and then he said, I'll, I'll join now, this is a very strong, like very body build kind of individual, um, legs bigger than um, my body kind of individual. He came out of it and was talking to the um, the yoga instructor and said, I had no idea what I was missing till I came into that class is that my physical is overtaking my mental. It's a very deep thought mm. and it's almost a thought where you actually have to think through what he meant and i get it and most people that practice yoga get it is that competition is real in american society and when you get to yoga you recognize the competition is yourself and if you can portray a kind respectful individual to yourself your body flourishes like a lotus flower. It opens up and the beauty is so amazing. And you can see the intricacy of all the things that work together. And as you said, unite. And so I want to finish up with today in that united way is those people that are listening that are somewhat intimidated by yoga, like I was, and I thought, you know, I can't, I can't touch my foot to my to my head. So I, I'm not going to be probably very good at yoga. Maybe they're intimidated. Maybe they've been injured. What would be some of the things that you would give them? Maybe some tips or some, some suggestions that might help them get started on a path that really reflects their mind and their body coming together to unite. Mm -hmm. And what, a, you know, what a beautiful way to put it their mind and their body to unite and and that's when you have those insights like um oh when i get angry my back pain flares up or i was i was living entirely in my i was letting the physical overtake me or i'm living entirely in my head so i think it's it's really important to to remind folks that that's ultimately what we're we're after here. We're we're supporting these insights. So it's worth it to to look around. It's worth it to find your flavor of yoga. It's worth it to find your yoga home. So a place that feels supportive, a place that that does um, offer the whole range of what yoga is so physical mental breath work the philosophy even and to yourself you know would you talk to someone else the way you talk to yourself this idea of being competitive with yourself and what if you were to instead be nourishing 
to yourself. So could you could you maybe have that intention going in into this endeavor? Or if you are a yoga practitioner already, looking for your next class or going into your next practice, and I have that intention of of being kind and respectful to myself. You know, a, a lot of a lot of people say to me, yoga class is the only place that I go where I'm unreachable. It's acceptable to turn on, not only acceptable, but pretty much required to turn my phone off. So give yourself that gift and remember that it does not have to look a certain way. It doesn't have to tick any particular boxes. It's very much customizable to you. I think that that is a message of hope for for all of us. It, there is the only thing you have to have to practice yoga. No fancy pants, no water bottle, no special mat or towel is an intention. The only thing you have to have to practice yoga is an intention to do so. That is a fantastic way to end today's segment. And I want to thank you. Intention is what it's all about. You've taken the time to listen to this podcast. The intention is there for our listeners to be productive and to have those moments of finding your peace and your meditative state that can bring you to a place where you recognize your body is with you all the time. And it's not just there when it has aches and pains. So Lori, it is such a pleasure to have you join us today. And I know that this is a special podcast that helps us reflect on our own balance in our lives and that being mental and physical. And I um, am often reminded by Albert Einstein, who is personally, I wish I was in the the same era because I just love how he thinks life is like riding a bicycle to keep your balance. You must keep moving. And you brought through the movement, the energy metaphysically and physically to where we need to go in today's world. So I am greatly appreciative of you taking the time and bringing your talent and wisdom to today's podcast. Such a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I want to thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Reality, where we spoke to Lori Highland Robertson and the benefits of both yoga and yoga therapy. And of course, how chiropractic is starting to change how people utilize their body and start to reflect on how their mind and body work together so functionally and important. Well, this podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. And as a special gift for listening today, I want you to visit f4cp.org slash health so that you can get a copy of our Mind, Body, Spirit ebook. And you can put this all together, what Dr. McAllister and Lori Robertson has talked about on how important it is to really have the reflection and being kind to yourself, which in today's world, that may be just a moment to just reflect on what you're good at and being sensitive to the things that you may be very hard on yourself about. So reflect on that Mind, Body, Spirit ebook. It's focused on the many ways to optimize your health and the ones that you love. And of course, it's always without the use of drugs or surgery, non-pharmacological approaches first. Don't forget to subscribe. We need your feedback. We love your feedback. Share this podcast with a friend or a family member, rate and review. Now, if you're feeling inspired to learn more about chiropractic and you haven't experienced it before, do yourself a favor. Find a doctor of chiropractic that is near you. Visit f4cp.org slash find a doctor. If you're already seeing a chiropractor, Thank them for giving you the mobility, stability, flexibility, and strength to carry on with your activities of daily living. The chiropractor always loves to hear from their patients, and it really is a world that comes together to unite for wellness care. We appreciate your support, and we look forward to you checking in again with us soon on Adjusted Reality. Adjusted Reality.